quantum computers, the next generation in computing. So fast because they run all calculations simultaneously. They'll break encryption as we know it. Or is this all hype? Well, in this video, I'll tell you exactly how they work with explanations modeled on different interpretations, where quantum computers might be useful, and we'll dispel one or two myths along the way. And just so you know, I recently made a video about post-quantum cryptography, which recounted the story of the world's nerdiest Hunger Games, an epic decade-long competition where cryptographers submitted encryption schemes and broke each other's, all to find new encryption standards which are resistant to quantum computers. In the video, I explore quantum computing, why RSA falls, and the detailed explanations of three new quantum resistance schemes. I'm immensely proud of the video, but it bombed, so I've decided to re-release the video in four parts, starting with this one. Enjoy! In this video, we're not going to go too deep into the mechanics of how classical or quantum computers work, just their abilities in the abstract. So, here we go. A classical computer is built on binary digits, or bits. They are in a zero state or a one state. Let's now say I'm terrible at arithmetic and I want to find out the double of all numbers from zero to seven. Then I can write a short script to say, take the starting number, double it, and spit out the answer. Eight computations, eight concrete answers. In contrast, a quantum computer is built from qubits. A qubit also has a value of zero or one, except its value isn't determined until we measure it. You can think of a classical bit as a coin on heads or on tails. It is what it is. A qubit is like a spinning coin with heads or tails, but its value is only determined when we look at it. By applying certain operations, we can alter the probability that it will fall on one side or the other. So say I randomize the coin in a way that makes each face 50-50, but then I subject it to a magnetic field which can say make heads a bit more likely. The coin is still in an undetermined state, but when I catch it, the result is locked. How is this physically possible? Well, again, we won't worry too much about the mechanics here, but one way to do this is with an electron. This has a property called spin, which can be in any direction, but if I apply a spin up or spin down gate, it will return spin up or spin down, and the act of measuring a certain spin will force the electron into that spin. Now, for example, I can subject this electron to a magnetic field to make its spin sideways. And now if I put a gate around it to ask whether it is spin up or spin down, it will force it into one of these two outcomes with equal probability. Once it has been measured, its spin is known and certain. Now I can apply a different magnetic field to make it more likely to be spin up, but sometimes it won't be. The process is still probabilistic. Another way to picture this, inspired by the many worlds interpretation, is that there are effectively infinitely many universes, but in each, when the gate is applied, half of them will give a spin up result and half a spin down. I don't know which universe I'm in, but by making a measurement, I find out. In the scenario where we skew the probabilities, the proportion of universes with spin up will be 75%. All these states exist in their own universe, we just don't know which one we're in until we measure and learn. However you choose to think about it, this is how particles behave, and therefore how qubits behave. So we can, as David Merman said, shut up and calculate. The standard way to denote the outcomes for one qubit looks like this. Then we associate each outcome with a probability. So in our earlier example, we might have a three quarters chance of observing one. Now we actually don't write the outcomes like this, we standardize them so that the coefficients of each outcome square to the probability of observing that outcome. Why do we do that? Well, these coefficients encode some physical properties of that qubit that I won't get into. I'll just add that these numbers can also be complex numbers. Taking their magnitude and squaring still gets us the probability. One nice byproduct of this standard way is that you can visualize these as a vector of length one seeing as the length is calculated by the root of the sum of the squares, which must be one due to the fact that all these probabilities must sum to one. With a two qubit system, there are four possible options, and we write the state as a linear combination of these, where again, the square of the coefficient gives the probability of observing that outcome. 
and we can extend this to as many qubits as we like, so let's do some calculations with a 4 qubit quantum computer. Earlier, when doubling the integers from 0 to 7, I had to do 8 separate calculations. But with a quantum computer, I can initialize my qubits so that there is a 1 8th chance of each of these integers being observed. So I've done one computation and I've calculated all eight answers. However, the qubits are now in a superposition of all of these answers. So if I look through the window of this black box, I will only see one of the answers. And after measurement, the superposition collapses and my qubits are set in that specific state. If you prefer the many worlds approach, there are effectively infinitely many universes and in each, the computer runs one multiply by two operation. It's only when I make an observation, I find out which universe I'm in. Either way, I only get one answer. So to find out the doubles of all eight numbers, I'm going to have to run at least eight separate computations. There's a very natural question to ask here. What the f is the point of this? And I want this question to drive home something crucial we must realize about quantum computers. They can't solve every problem. They can't even improve upon classical computers for many problems. They are very good at only specific things. A common description of quantum computers is that they perform all calculations simultaneously, thus speeding up computations. But this is misleading. They only ever return one answer. So where might they be useful? Well, let's play a very contrived game. I'm thinking of an integer, and I'll tell you that its square is less than 10, and I'll tell you when you're looking at the correct square. For this example, let's assume you know enough to realize it has to be between minus three and three, but you need a computer to verify the solution. Also from now on, instead of representing things in binary, let's just assume I have enough bits to represent the necessary integers. So with the classical computer, we feed in the inputs, we get the outputs, and now let's say I have an am I right function. Feed the outputs into this, and it returns true or false. After seven distinct computations, we know the possibilities for my number. Now, how might a quantum computer tackle this? Well, let's set things up in the same way, and we'll also have a quantum am I right function that we'll get back to shortly. Now, a clever thing we can do is entangle two sets of qubits. So I've got one set of qubits, and there's a 1 8th chance that I'll observe each of these outcomes, and I'll entangle them with another set of qubits. There are many ways to write this, but today I'll just concatenate them. The typical example of this is in two pair-produced electrons. They must have opposite spins, but it's random as to which spin each has. Each has a likelihood, if I measure it, of being spin up. But once one is measured and its spin is made certain, the others will be made certain even without measuring. How do we exploit this property? Well, we have two sets of entangled qubits all set to the same thing, but now we square the second set. This forms an input set and an output set. Now here's the clever part. I'm going to measure the output set. Notice that there are only four outcomes all equally likely. So let's say I measure a 9 there. Now I know that my first set of qubits are definitely either set to minus 3 or 3 without even having to look. How do we use this? Well, let's bring this quantum am I right function back into play. Classical am I right returns true or false on the correct output. Quantum am I right has the effect of boosting the probability of the correct output. So, let's say I apply it on my output set and say it inflates the probability of output 4 to 80%. Now, when I measure, I'm most likely going to measure 4. And now, due to entanglement, I'm guaranteed to measure one of the two correct inputs. In the many worlds approach, all eight situations were equally likely, but then the am I right function boosted the probability of output 4. After measuring, we were probably going to be in an input 2 or input minus 2 universe. I can observe one of the correct inputs with certainty. To summarize, in the classical case, that was seven independent computations, each followed by an am I right check. In the quantum case, it was one computation and then one am I right application. 
Unfortunately, I wasn't guaranteed to get a correct answer. It was only an 80% chance of observing a correct input, but if I repeated this, say, four times, it's very unlikely that my process will yield a false positive. Now, this might not sound like a big deal, but what if there were a thousand options for my number? The classical computer would run a thousand computations, while the quantum computer might still only get away with just doing a few. Change this from a toy, I'm thinking of a number problem into a real life, I have a password problem, and you might start seeing the power of quantum computers. But, and it's the biggest but that I can think to discuss without getting my video demonetized, there is a huge problem that I glossed over. This am I right function that magically inflates the probability for the correct output. How do we actually make this? Most of the time, we can't. This function is fictitious, except for a few exceptional circumstances. I introduced it to give you a feeling for why quantum computers are considered powerful, but in reality, it turns out that making these is extraordinarily difficult, maybe impossible in many cases. One powerful am I right function is called a diffuser, which is used as part of Grover's algorithm to speed up brute force computations to an extraordinary degree. But even this doesn't help with many cryptographic applications where the numbers used are so large that even that saving doesn't grant a practical advantage. It also has the downside of requiring us to know the correct answer in advance. Not great for password guessing applications. Now, as a thank you for their generous support, I've given an outline of Grover's algorithm in the extended cut of this video available to my patrons. This video took me five months to make. If it bombs, I'll have basically made no money through YouTube in that time. So it is only thanks to their support that I can take risks on videos like this. See below if you'd like to support me too. As fortune would have it, or misfortune depending on how you look at it, another powerful am I right function is called a quantum Fourier transform, which is used as part of Shaw's algorithm to crack RSA and other current cryptographic standards. Thanks for watching. Next week we'll explore exactly how the quantum Fourier transform works and how it breaks RSA. If you don't want to wait, you can check out the full video which has all the context of the epic NIST competition. This has been another proof under another roof. Until next time.